Okay, welcome to the Calabasas Library Book Club. And we are so delighted to have the author, William Ken Kruger, who goes by Kent Kruger, um, visiting us with us tonight. And um, so I just wanna say that both this library book club and my own personal book club read um, Ordinary Grace and This Tenderland. And in the 16 years of doing my personal book club, I don't think we've ever had the whole group love both books without anyone having a criticism. You know, I mean, they, they love both books is what I'm trying to say. So um, it's wonderful that we get to actually meet you. And um, often when I'm doing these book clubs, I do a little biography of the author, but since you were here, I'm gonna let you do your own biography and talk a little bit about your book. Um, well, I'm a little disappointed. I would love to hear what you had to say about me. <laughs> Maybe well, you know things even I don't know. <laughs> probably just what's on your website, actually. <laughs> well, thank you, Barbara. It's a, a delight to be with you this evening. Thank you for the invitation to join the, your club discussion. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. Um, although I do publish under that very literary three-name thing, William Kent Kruger. I go by Kent. So as we talk this evening, feel free to call me Kent. Uh, I live in St. Paul, Minnesota. I have for the last 40 years with, uh, with my wife of, let's see, last March, it was 47 years. Uh, our children live here, my grandson lives here. Despite the fact that we've already had uh, a foot of snow, <laughs> I dearly love living in Minnesota. Um, what I want to talk to you, I think that's probably enough of a bio. Is there anything you wanted to add, Barbara? Well, I did notice that, you know, in your background that you had been kicked out of Stanford for, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. That's not a, a typical part of my bio, but I love telling this story. So thanks for asking. So here's the Stanford story. Um, I, uh, I matriculated at Stanford in, in the fall of 1969, and this was deep in the heart of the Vietnam War conflict, the Vietnam conflict. Um, and um, if you remember that period of time, it was a, a period of just enormous division in our nation. Um, towns were divided, families were divided. Stanford University at that point in time had a... Um, and if you remember the spring of 1970, particularly, that was the spring of the Kent State shootings. Right. It was the spring when we discovered that uh, our government had been lying to us and they were carrying on a secret war in Laos and Cambodia. Stanford at that point in time had a relationship with an organization called the Stanford Research Institute, SRI, whose primary source of income at that point in time was research into military weaponry. And there were a lot of us at Stanford that felt that that was a, an inappropriate relationship for an institution like Stanford to maintain, particularly at that point in history. So we petitioned for a dissolution of that arrangement, that relationship. Um, we petitioned the, the board of directors, the trustees, the administration, we marched. And of course, nobody listened to us because there were huge sums of money involved. Um, finally, uh, fed up with uh, getting nowhere, a group of us one day marched into the administration building and occupied it. The president at that point was a guy named Richard Lyman, who was a pretty reasonable guy, actually. He said, uh, fine, I'm not going to give you any trouble. And he vacated the building, turned it over to us. Well, that night, uh, we held a dance in the, uh, in the area where typically we would all have registered for our classes. And about midnight, the, uh, the band packed up and took off. And those of us who were going to occupy the building rolled out our sleeping bags and went to sleep. Big logistical error, because at one o'clock, the Palo Alto riot squad swept through and arrested us all. I was on a full scholarship to Stanford, and my scholarship evaporated, so I had to leave the school. Um, but, it, you know, the, one of the most important things for me that, uh, that happened as a result of that was that when I called my parents to tell them my situation, my father in particular said, I have never been more proud of you. Um, and I got to tell you, honestly, Barbara, across all these years, it's been far more interesting to tell people I was kicked out of Stanford than that I graduated from the place. 
that's so I, that was going to be my next question. What did your parents think? But that's a nice response that your father yeah, had. Yeah, they were, uh, they were so incredibly supportive of me. And, you know, they have been supportive of me from the very beginning, which leads me into why I'm a writer. Uh, I'm a writer because of my parents. Um, you know, I'd be a Freudian analyst dream. I blame everything on my parents. Um, why do I say this? I, I say my parents are responsible, responsible for me becoming a writer because when I was a kid, I had parents who I hope, like the parents of everyone uh, watching, um, read to me. As a kid, I never went down for a nap. I never went to bed at night without a story being read to me. So I grew up thinking of the world in terms of stories. And for whatever reason, I always wanted to be one of the, one of the storytellers. The first story I remember writing was a short story in the third grade. It was called The Walking Dictionary. Uh, now I gotta tell you this, my father was a high school English teacher. And when I was a kid, he was always storming around the house, ranting something like, nobody uses dictionaries enough. Nobody uses dictionaries enough. So in the third grade, I wrote a short story called The Walking Dictionary, which was in fact about a dictionary that didn't think it was being used enough. It magically sprouted legs so that it could toddle off into the world and go to the people that needed it. My third grade teacher went gaga over that story. My folks oohed and awed over that story. I swear to you, in the third grade, I knew I was destined to be a writer. So I have always written, but I served a very long apprenticeship. I didn't publish my first novel until I was 48 years old. And that was the debut novel in my long running, my now long running Cork O'Connor mystery series. Um, I don't know if those of you watching, uh, if you've only read This Tender Land or Ordinary Grace, you may not be aware of the fact that I am the author of um, a mystery series. I'm the author of the, I love saying this, New York Times best-selling Cork O'Connor mystery series, which is set up in the great north woods of Minnesota. My protagonist in that series, Cork O'Connor, is a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe. There are currently 17 titles in that series. I just turned in number 18. It'll be out uh, in the fall of next year. So I cut my teeth on mysteries. That's really where I developed my initial following of readership. But about 10 years ago, a story idea came to me that wasn't a Cork O'Connor story. And when I proposed the project to my publisher, they didn't want it. In fact, they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic and set me down and said, Kent, we only want Cork O'Connor stories from you. So I knew uh, if I wrote the piece, it was going to be a risky proposition. But it was a story that spoke to me in such a compelling way uh, that I knew I had to write it. So across the course of the next three years, every moment that wasn't devoted to a contractual obligation in my Cork O'Connor series, I spent writing the manuscript for a novel called Ordinary Grace. Now, for those of you who have never read Ordinary Grace, here's the down and dirty on it. It takes place in the summer of 1961. It's the story of a Methodist minister um, it's, and it's set in a, a small town in, oh, in the very beautiful Minnesota River Valley. It's the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. That's the compelling mystery component. But at heart, it's really the story of what this terrible tragedy does to this man's faith, his family, and ultimately the entire fabric of this small town in which he lives. Even though my publisher told me they didn't want the, the manuscript when I, was when I was finished with it, I went ahead and sent it to my editor at Simon & Schuster. She fell in love with it. She said, of course, we're gonna publish it. And they did. And Ordinary Grace has had just this really remarkable, really gratifying reception from critics and readers alike. It won tons of awards when it came out. It's been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. Uh, so far, it's sold nearly a million copies. Now, when my publisher saw how well that book was doing, boy, did they want another book just like it. So I signed a contract for a companion novel to Ordinary Grace. They paid me way too much money for it. And I spent the next two years composing what I thought would be the companion novel to Ordinary Grace, the follow-up novel. Now that manuscript was contractually due to my publisher five years ago. Two months before that contractual deadline, I set up a meeting in Chicago to talk to my agent about revisions to the piece because there were problems with it. I knew it, she knew it. 
two days before we got together, together, I sent her a note saying, when we meet, I don't want to talk about how we revise this piece. I want to talk about how we keep it from being published. Because it wasn't the story I thought it would be. I had no idea how to make it that story. And frankly, my heart wasn't in it. Uh, my publisher turned out to be really understanding. They said, fine, you don't have to uh, give us this manuscript, but you still owe us a companion novel. So here's the deal. The expectations for that follow-up novel, that companion novel, were enormous. And the whole time I was trying to write that story, I just felt weighted, crushed by the weight of all those expectations. And the truth is, while I was writing it, what I was doing was trying to meet everybody else's expectations instead of writing the story that spoke to me from my heart. But as soon as all that weight got lifted off my shoulders, I saw so clearly the story I should have been writing, the story that did speak to me from my heart. And honestly, Barbara, it's a story I've wanted to write since I was 11 years old. When I was 11, that would have been in the fifth grade, our teacher read to the class, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. She did it by reading half an hour after lunch every day. I love that book. Here was this kid and he was just like me and he was out there on the Mississippi River having these really great adventures. Then after that, of course, I had to read Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which I loved even more. And across my entire journey as a writer, my career as a writer, I have wanted to write a story that would pay homage to Mark Twain that might be in its own way, an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. And that's where this tender land came from. Now, what about the, uh, the whole aspect of the um, Indian boarding schools? I have to say, I, I'm embarrassed to say I had never heard about that. I'm from the East Coast, so I don't think we had any there. I could be wrong. But You're wrong. You, you did. They were all over the country. There were 360 Native American boarding schools at the peak of that movement. How, you just knew about them or how did you find out about them? How did you do the research? Well, because uh, of my Cork O'Connor series, uh, which deals significantly with the Ojibwe, uh, which is the largest tribal affiliation in northern Minnesota, um, I have been aware of that tragic period of our history for a very long time. Here's the reason I decided to open this tender land in a Native American boarding school. I don't know how many readers got this, but uh, this tender land is structured in the same way that Homer structured the Odyssey. So every experience that the children have um, across their, their epic journey that summer mirrors an experience and adventure that Odysseus had in his long journey from Ithaca back to Troy. And if you remember um, the Odyssey, it begins with Odysseus leaving a war zone. He's leaving a ransacked, ravaged Troy. And when I thought about uh, what kind of a war zone the children, the four vagabonds would be leaving, I thought there was nothing more horrific that I could imagine than a Native American boarding school. From the late 1880s until 1978, when the National Indian Child Welfare Act was passed, if you were a Native American parent and the government came for your child and said, we are going to cart this child to a boarding school hundreds of miles away. There was nothing you could do about it. You had no, you had no voice. It was the law. You had to give up your child. And the truth about the boarding school, until 1978, that was the law. By then it was seldom practiced, but it was still on the books. Um, so, uh, so I decided that's where the children were going to begin their journey. Now, I knew about the, the Native American boarding schools. I've known about them for many, many years. But in order to create that environment, believably, I had to, to do an enormous amount of research. Um, and so I read first per, tragic first person account after first person account of survivors of the Native American boarding school system. And the truth is, Barbara, um, I could have made that first section even more horrific. Uh, the horrors were unbelievable, um, but I toned it down because I didn't want readers to, to put the book down and not be able to get beyond it. And one of the things that I did hope, and you just, um, you just made my heart glad, is that I might be able to 
uh, inform particularly white readers who had no idea that this system was going on, I might be able to inform them about uh, what had happened. Yet another travesty in our relationship with our Native American brothers and sisters. You know, it's interesting in the book, and I've seen this in discussion questions, that uh, none of the Native children speak in your book. Moses, Moses, then the Native American kid, I knew was going to be mute because I knew he was going to represent a culture that had no voice. And you're right, if you look at the story, um, you get almost no words spoken by the Native American kids in that school. Um, and there was a reason for that. You know, when the kids, when the kids arrived at the boarding school, exactly what, what o Odie describes happened. They were, um, their clothes were taken from them. Their hair was shorn. They were given uniforms to wear. They could no longer speak their native tongue. They were punished for it if they did. They could not practice their native religion. They were punished for it if they did. Um, so it was just a horrific situation. write about the quest for the meaning of God. Um, and I'm wondering, is this something that, are you religious or, or is this just a, a question that we all, you think we're all striving for? Yeah, I don't really think of my, you know, I attend church every Sunday, but I don't really think of myself as a religious person. I'm uh, very skeptical of religion. Uh, I think it uh, narrows our, our um, thinking about the divine. It can greatly do that. But I am a spiritual person. And I guess I have to say, I believe uh, I'm on a spiritual journey. And I think we're all on a spiritual journey, whether we embrace that or not. So if you read my Cork O'Connor series, you're going to see uh, spiritual. Very often there is an undercurrent in, those, in the plots that I create that deals with the spiritual journey. Um, because it's been an important journey for me my whole life. So if you have a minute, I'll tell you about my spiritual journey. You got a moment and why I put it that, uh, why it's such a huge element in the stories that I create. I don't know where everybody else, I don't know where those of you watching, I don't know where your spiritual journey began, but I can tell you exactly where my began. Began uh, when I was six years old and as a result of seeing a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man. I doubt that anybody watching out there remembers The Incredible Shrinking Man. But it was one of those great B science fiction movies that was all over the big screen back in the 1950s. Uh, it's about this guy who goes boating off the coast of California and while he's out there on the ocean, he happens to pass through this very strange, mysterious luminous mist, uh, which of course turns out to be a radioactive mist because everything in the great B science fiction movies of the 50s was the result of radioactivity, you know, the dawn of the atomic age. So a few weeks after he passes through this mist, he begins to shrink. And the smaller he gets, the more his perspective of the world changes. So he gets to like the size of, uh, of the munchkins in The Wizard of Oz. And he sees the world as little people see the world. He gets even smaller and he gets to the point where the family cat, who used to look to him for food, looks at him as food. He gets really tiny and he battles a spider over some bur dropped birthday cake. Uh, because he's starving to death. Near the end of the movie, he's become so tiny that he slips out of the house through the mesh on the window screen. And right at the end of that film, he is so minute that he enters existence on a molecular level. And do you know what he discovers? There's a universe there too. And so what I understood when I walked out of that movie theater at six was that life existence was a great deal larger and a great deal smaller and a great deal more mysterious than I was ever going to be able to comprehend. And that's where I, I date the beginning of my own spiritual journey to the asking of those questions that really have no concrete answer. Uh, after that, my spiritual journey was shaped uh, by my religious upbringing, probably like most of the people who are watching. And uh, when I graduated from high school, probably like a lot of people who are watching, I decided it was time to put my spiritual journey behind me. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1969. And for those of you who are old enough to remember the, uh, the world as it was then, uh, I graduated into a culture that was dominated by three things, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. A really difficult uh, you know, um, combination for the spiritual journey to compete with. So when I left high school, I was ready to embark on an entirely different kind of uh, journey altogether. But then I began to write the stories in the Coco Connor series in which spiritual questions began to bubble up in the plots that I created. And I realized that I had never really abandoned the spiritual journey. 
And so I wrote Ordinary Grace because I wanted to write a story that focused more specifically on the importance of the journey, uh, spiritual journey that we're on. And of course, when I created uh, this tender land, I love, I love rivers because they're metaphors for so many things. And the rivers here are certainly a, a metaphor for the spiritual journey that Odie is on. Wow, that's beautifully said. Um, also, in both books, your characters are, are either turning 13 or 13 year old boys. Um, <laughs> is that, that just, why is that such an important period, you think, for these stories? Well, for me, 13 years old was uh, was a really important period in my life. I think it's, I don't know what being 13 years old is like for women, but for guys, it's really an important period. You know, we're standing there in the threshold to our manhood. We've got one foot firmly planted in our childhood and one foot poised to take us forward, but uh, but we're not ready to go there yet for many reasons I, across the, the entire course of my life. I have vividly remembered the uh, the summer I was 13 years old. And, and I have to tell you, I honestly believe that most men never really mature past 13 years old. <laughs> I think we're all stuck in our adolescence. <laughs> so it's really easy for me to tap into a 13 year old mindset. And I, I really love doing that. Um, I did it first with Ordinary Grace and it worked extremely well. And so I decided that's the age that Odie is gonna be um, because essentially that's uh, the age that, uh, that Huck Finn was when he uh, headed off on his his river journey. So 13 year old, uh, that 13 year old voice and uh, perception really speaks to me. Great. Um, also, I in this tender land, music plays an important part. Oh, yeah. Um, and I love on your website, you have a, a playlist for for listening to the music. Uh, do you play music? Are you a mu musician at all? I came from a very musical home. My mother uh, graduated from college with uh, a dual degree, a degree in music and a degree in uh, drama. She had this beautiful ethereal uh, soprano voice and uh, just a beautiful way with the keyboard. And I know that she wanted all of her children to become musicians, but none of us did. We disappointed her greatly. So I'm not a musician. Yes, but but you're, uh, you're still creative. I'm still very creative <laughs> in, in many other ways, uh, I think anyway. <laughs> Um, but when I was thinking about the part that Odie was going to play in the story, Odie plays several important parts. First of all, he's the narrator of this tender land. Um, and, and I was able then to use Odie to, to say a lot of things that I deeply believe about the world and particularly about storytelling. Odie is also the guy in the story who keeps the vagabonds on track heading to St. Louis. He's the one who says, okay, we're gonna stop here for a little bit, but we're going to St. Louis. We're not staying here, we're going to St. Louis. And he's also the guy who is um, responsible for keeping the, the spirits of the vagabonds up when things look dark. And when I thought about that, I thought, okay, how is he gonna do that? And he does it as a storyteller. That's one of the techniques he uses it, but even more important, he uses music. I knew he was gonna use music because music is, you know, it's so elemental to who we are as human beings. It speaks to us in such a mysterious way. We fall in love to music. We get married to music. We get buried to music. We go to war to music. You know, what would a what would a movie be without a, a musical soundtrack, you know? So I knew Odie was going to be a musician. And then I had to figure out, okay, if he's a musician, what kind of instrument could he reasonably take on a journey like this? And a harmonica seemed the most natural instrument to give him. I don't play the harmonica. Um, although I vowed before this book came out that I was at least going to learn how to play Shenandoah on the, on the harmonica. Never did. Uh, so, so I had a lot of fun when I knew he was going to be a, a harmonica player, which is such an American sort of instrument. I had a lot of fun choosing the tunes that he was gonna play. And so many of them were favorite tunes out of my own childhood. And so anybody listening, as Barbara pointed out, I have a Spotify list on my website of all of the tunes that Odie plays in the course of this tender land. And uh, the renditions that have been chosen are um, those that Odie probably would have been familiar with uh, back in his day. They're just, they're just wonderful. I, I hope I hope you take it. Those of you out there listening, hope or watching, I hope you take advantage of that. Um, one of the other questions on your website too. It talks about you know if you were, if it was going to be a movie, who would play what parts? But have you been approached at all about uh, making your books into movies? I've been dealing with Hollywood for over twenty years now. Oh, really? Have you seen any of my work on the big screen yet? 
dealing with Hollywood is really a, an exercise in frustration, uh, a Zen exercise in patience and forgiveness. Um, yes, so Ordinary Grace has been optioned and uh, a, a script for it is currently being written. Uh, we have been in discussions with three different production companies for the rights to this tender land. I had a meeting last month with a Hollywood producer who is interested in bringing my Cork O'Connor series to television as a series. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of interest. Don't hold your breath, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe some of the people on this, uh, on this uh, Zoom have some connections. Yeah, you, you're all California people. Does, doesn't everybody in California LA. have a connection with the movie industry? <laughs> I don't, but maybe somebody <laughs> somebody on here does. Um, I actually just have one more really important question, and then maybe I'll open it up. I noticed that uh, you said you like to write in coffee shops. I don't know about, uh, is it closed down like we are in LA? And where are you writing if you're not in a coffee shop? You know, I, I comp until the coronavirus began, I had composed every novel that I've written in coffee shops. I simply cannot write at home. Um, but once the corona, so this is my process. I get up at six o'clock every morning, seven days a week. And in the past, I would get myself dressed and go to a coffee shop where I would spend the first two or even three hours uh, of the day writing. Uh, but because of the coronavirus, our coffee shops are closed. So I have exchanged my kitchen counter for the coffee shop and I'm married to the world's most wonderful woman. She has vowed to stay in bed every morning until I finish with my writing. What a sacrifice. Yeah, really. <laughs> so yeah, I still write every morning, seven days a week, but, um, but no longer in the coffee shop. As soon as the shops open up again and we all are safe to go back, I'll be back there. That's nice of her, because I don't know if you noticed, but I had people walking in and out of my room as we we're talking, going, go, go, go away. Um, okay, so uh, if uh, we want to open it up to people for questions, yes. does anybody, um, yes, we I could unmute you, and but please, um, if you could either say in the chat that you want to ask a question or raise your hand if you're um if you can't see me okay uh, okay uh, iris you want to ask a question uh, yes uh my comment was that the title of the book is the uh wonderful piece by aaron copeland which does uh feature a folk song uh or a hymn actually it's called his a gift to be simple and it, uh, his, and so when I saw the title "Tender Land," I immediately thought of that beautiful, beautiful music, which anybody could look up and hear. Well, and, here, here's the inspiration for the title, Iris. Yes. I didn't, I didn't have a title for the manuscript, but one day I happened to be driving across southern Minnesota while I was doing the research for the book, and uh, and I was listening to our classical public radio station. And the most beautiful piece of music came on and one that I was totally unfamiliar with. And at the end of it, the announcer came on and he said, you have been listening to an excerpt from the only uh, opera Aaron Copeland ever composed mm -hmm. called, and I thought he said, This Tender Land. Yes. The actual title of the opera is The Tender yes. Land. But I heard This Tender Land and I thought, well, there's my title. I know, and I, I, I love that, and I loved all the music. I wrote, I wrote the titles. So I was reading the book. I just wrote the titles of all the songs down, and so uh, for me, I'm a folk song devotee. It just added so much, to, and, and the times in the book when he plays and everybody is drawn in, yes. Thank you. Gloria, did you yeah, have a comment? I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, sure can. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. This is Gloria. Can you hear me? Yes, Gloria, we can hear you. Good, because I can't seem to change it up, uh, on the uh, video. That's OK. We have it controlled. So go ahead. OK. I have several questions. <laughs> Number one. 
the uh, the schools that you talk about, the boarding schools, were similar to the ones that were in Australia and New Zealand. Yes. Are, are, you are familiar with yes. that. Yes. It was the same sort of thing that was done. Yes. And some of those have been made into movies. Mm -hmm. You are aware of that? Yes. Uh, Rapper Proof Fence, is that? That's uh, it. Yeah. Yes. 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 I've seen it too. I've seen it. My next question is, when people, when authors write about books, they put themselves into one of the characters. Did you feel that you were one of the characters in the book? Absolutely. All right, would you like to tell us which one? Sure. <laughs> Gloria, do you have a guess? Well, of course it has to be Odie or whatever the heck his name is. So you Bingo, <laughs> Odie O'Banion. Yeah, he's yeah. a storyteller, I'm a storyteller. Uh, yes. Odie's a kid who loves adventure. I love adventure. Um, Odie's a little, a little, there are things about Odie that are not like me, or at least weren't like me when I was a kid. Uh, Odie is, is uh, rebellious. He pushes back against authority. I didn't do that until I went to Stanford. Mm -hmm. um, Odie is, uh, he's resourceful. Um, he's loyal. Uh, and, and he's not above stooping to a bit of larceny if the situation requires it. I absolutely loved Odie, and I really invested my heart in that kid. Yes, that was I really obvious. identified with him. Okay, and how would you feel if some of the characters did not feel the way you did? I mean, there was this feeling of, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, the last book, one of the books that we had read, read was the water dancer. And it was the same sort of thing, a very ethereal kind of thing. And that's what this book was. And I, it annoyed me. Uh, <laughs> I would have liked it if it hadn't been so ethereal. I liked the book, but I didn't like what happened to it at the end. And uh, how would you feel if people don't want that? Hey, it's my story. I can write whatever I want. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> if you want a different ending? You write your own story. <laughs> well, I might. Um, one of the things I love that you said, Kent, was um, at the end when he's talking about when I think Evie, um, S Sister Eve, is talking about Emmy, and they're talking. I think what Glory is talking about is a little bit of like magic realism. Yes. Um, um, where he says. Um, Odie says, what are you talking about? You, you, she changed the future. And, and he, and she says, well, like a storyteller, right? Do you remember that part? I'm sure you wrote it. <laughs> like a storyteller, I can decide how, th how she could kind of decide how things are like yes, a story. In a book you can, but you can't do it in real life. Oh, I so disagree with you, Gloria. How can you do it in real life? Let me tell you about my mother. Okay. My, mother was a my mother was a seer. It was uh, very common when I was growing up for the telephone to ring and my mother could tell you exactly who was calling. Um, she would sometimes toss and turn for nights on end and she would say something terrible is going to happen to, sometimes she knew, sometimes she didn't, but something terrible would happen. So I have no trouble at all uh, believing, absolutely believing that there are people out there who see the world in a way that you and I do not. Um, and as Odie says, um, and I so profoundly believe what Odie says, I think we all need to open our, our, um, our acceptance to every possibility because really there's nothing our hearts can imagine that is not so. I absolutely believe- about it? Feeling yeah, about his mother, though. People who, could, who probably could tweak the future. Uh, on the other hand, if you if you remember Odie's final comment, it's, do you know, some of what I've told you is true, and the rest, well, maybe just think of it as the bloom on the rose bush and let it go. Okay, but there are those of us who can't. But it, it was, <laughs> I have to tell you that I did enjoy the book until we got to that part, and that part bothered me. Okay, duly noted. Okay, so Gloria, in the future, we either have to read nonfiction or totally realistic fiction. 
<laughs> well, there are other books that don't go the way The Water Dancer did, which I loved, by the way. And the way this book did, which I didn't love, but I liked. And remember, um, it's fiction. <laughs> I know it's fiction. I know it's fiction. But I um, want real life. Um, so uh, here's a question from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, I, if you want me to read it. Um, I want to know what motivated him to insert Jewish characters in 1932 and also include a lesbian relationship. If you look at the book, a lot of the book is about the prejudices that we hold and the very real um, realization that we all have to come to that we're all just human beings. Um, and we need to be able to embrace the beliefs that others have, um, the way others choose to live their lives. Um, so you see a great deal of prejudice against the Native American community as it's exhibited in the Native American boarding school. You see a prejudice against people who are struggling, the poor people um, at Hopersville, where many in a town refused to, uh, to accept them. Um, when we got to the West Side Flats in St. Paul, um, that's a, the history of the, of the flats is a real history. Here in St. Paul, it was the place where most uh, poor uh, Eastern European uh, Jews settled when they came here uh, because it was an area that flooded every spring and nobody else wanted to live there. Um, and so it was an opportunity to talk about the prejudices that existed back then. St. Paul is an Irish, very Irish community, grew up a very Irish community. And uh, the prejudice against the Jewish um, uh, people who came here was tremendous. Um, and very many, many, many years ago, I had written a story about a lesbian relationship um, on the river and uh, never particularly liked the story, but I thought, well, I'm gonna bring it back. As a writer, you never throw anything away. So I thought I'm gonna bring it back and that's what I, I'm gonna create here for Flo and Gertie, two women who have huge hearts and love one another tremendously. And because of that, they can open Odie's eyes to the world in a, in a way that they haven't been opened before. What you say is lovely. Thank you. And Laurel, you have a question. Um, everyone can put on the cameras if they want. How? Yeah, it's sort of nice but, to see what I'm talking to. Yeah, and Laurel, go ahead and ask your question. Do you, you're muted though, Laurel. It says I'm unable to start the video. Okay, now am yeah, I? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, I have a question about the writing process. Um, how do you uh, start and lay out a book like this? You say you go to the coffee shop. Do you do a uh, like a beginning, middle, end, and fill it in? Do you know how the ending, the, what the ending is, before you uh, get going on it, or does it sort of evolve as you're writing? Um, how, how does that how does that happen? depends upon the kind of story I'm writing. When I'm writing a story for the Cork O'Connor series, those are all essentially mysteries. And a mystery is one of the most tightly woven fabrics of storytelling. Everything depends so significantly on everything else. And I think the success of a mystery depends largely on the timing of the reveals. When do you deliver to the reader the clues that's going to help the reader solve the puzzle at the heart of the story? So uh, when I write a, a story in the Cork O'Connor series, I think that story through as significantly as I can before, ever, before I ever put my fingers on the keyboard. Um, it's in my head for several weeks or sometimes even several months. And by the end of that thinking period, I know how the story begins. I know how it ends. I know who did what to whom and why. I know the, the themes that I wanna weave through the story, but I approach this tender land in an entirely different way. I wanted a different process. I wanted it to be a more organic story. I wanted to discover the story as I was writing it. And so I knew very few things going into the writing of uh, this tender land. I knew that uh, it was going to be a, 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 a Huck Finn sort of a tale. Uh, I knew it was going to be set in the depression because one of the things that I wanted to talk about is who we are as human beings. Um, are we the kind of people who, particularly during periods of privation, are we the kind of people who retreat into ourselves and protect that which is most important to us? Or are we the kind of people who open our arms and despite how little we, we, we might have, we're willing to share that with those who have less. 
Um, and I couldn't think of a better time period to, to explore that theme in than the Great Depression. So I knew it was going to be set in the Depression. Uh, I knew it was going to be structured in the same way that Homer structured the Odyssey. Um, and then I began. And I really was, as I was writing each section, trying to figure out, okay, in the next section, what the hell is going to happen? What are the kids going to experience that will move them along in the story and will mirror something that uh, Odysseus experienced? So I didn't have a master plan. And honestly, uh, when the kids were, uh, were getting to the St. Paul section, that second to the final section, I still had no idea who was going to go to St. Louis, why they were going to St. Louis, and what the hell was going on with this Aunt Julia person? <laughs> why is she so important? It's a wonderful part of the book. I really, really <laughs> love this. So you were, you were actually uh, uh, floating down the river like the characters. Indeed, and, I was. And but I uh, you. unexpected adventures were uh, happening as you, as you went down your journey, right? They, they did. And it was a remarkable, just a remarkable journey. There were so many things that I had never you know, planned beforehand that as I came to this place, they, they just were there for me. For example, when the kids, uh, after they leave Sister Eve and they spend time on the island where they discover the skeleton of the Native yes. American kid, that was not a part of my thinking until they got to the island and I wanted them to have Is that true? Is that true? Is that part true? Uh, no, that was that was fiction. Oh, because it was wonderful. It was a wonderful part. Well, and then it led nat very naturally into Moses' rumination on who he is and where he's come from. Yes. And the next section of the book is his exploration of his the the people from from whom he has come. Well, the, we we are not. I don't think that Americans, the rest of us, are truly aware of what we have done to the American Indians and how we have destroyed their culture and destroyed a lot of what has happened. And so that part was very interesting to me. But the other comment that you made about, you don't know about boys being, when they're 13, are that they're supposed to be men into the Jewish religion. Yes, they are, because that's when they become bar mitzvahed. Yeah, and they are decided, and it's decided that they're men. They're not, but that's <laughs> what's decided. Yeah, there's a difference between a, a ritual and the reality. Yeah, <laughs> but it, but it was a lot of the things that you had to say and that you did were very interesting. I thought that I was not aware of. I was very much aware about the Indian schools because I had read a lot about Australia and New Zealand mm -hmm. and the American Indian schools. And that is disgraceful that we are not aware of what has what we've done and what has happened. So um, thank you for doing that. Kent, here's a question from uh, Carol Carter. In your research, did you check the Autry Museum? Their Native Voices Theater troupe put on a play some years ago based on diaries from the boarding schools. Is the Autry Museum in Arizona, Phoenix? No, it's in LA. Oh, is it in LA? Then no, I, I haven't been there. But you did go, you did see something in Arizona? Yes, there is a Native American boarding school uh, museum in Arizona and I can't remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. it. At the Autry Museum where I'm a docent, we have a wonderful, it's the only, it's the very first Native American theater troupe, and it's over 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And I just learned last week, they are in the process of digitizing the Native, their Native Voices productions. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to go online into the Autry Museum archives, recordings, and check Native Voices. And it was a huge, group. There were about 12 or 15. Uh, They're all Native American actors and reading from the diaries, which I had learned about after, you know, doing all my learning at the Autry over these years. And they were so incredible. And they remember, one of them reminded me of the story of the kinder transport children because 
some of these children, when they could see their parents again, didn't want to. Just yeah. the way some of the kinder transport kids whose parents did that to save them, sending them off to England. And some of them, it was the same. I mean, I just think about it and I tighten up. So um, if, if feel free, we have wonderful archives. And, Perhaps and, you could show them to us on one of the classes that we have. Well, I can, I can, um, I can email uh, Barbara the link uh, and then they're, they're building on it. We have gotten a grant to do that, and um, and, and we have we have um, adv not um, not adv we have an advisory council of local Native Americans who work on this and and okay everything that we put on there. It's a very it's important thing, I think, for us to know about. Okay, it's an exciting prospect. Thank you for uh, for letting us all know about it. We have about five more minutes. Does anybody else have a question? Anybody out there? Yes. Could we not? Could we have a oh, book? I'm sorry. Okay. I, I unmuted myself. Uh, it, we, uh, the statistics are that the largest uh, percentage of people with coronavirus are, is, uh, the, are on the Navajo reservations. And if you've been there, you, there, everything is so spread out. The roads, if it were to rain, for example, they would be closed. It's poverty stricken. And so that's, they have the highest number of deaths for the population. In the and and no, very little access to medical care there. Right, yeah. Yes. I've been there. Water, electricity. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. I would like to ask if perhaps a book that we, the next book that we do, could not be uh, as ethereal, perhaps, as the last few books that we've had. <laughs> well, okay. I already have one picked out, but we'll talk about that after we say goodbye to Ken. Ken, thank you so much. This was so great oh. for you to take your time. Thank you so this. much. Yeah, yeah, it was thank wonderful. You. Marvelous. Yeah. And uh, I look forward to your next series book and um, have to go back in the library and make sure we have all the other other ones. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that, Barbara. Good. Yeah, thank so. Very much. That was and great. Uh, maybe if you ever do a, a second book, a follow-up to Ordinary Grace, you could come back. Okay. About that too. Please, all right. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Stay yeah. safe. Thank you so Stay much. Hopeful. Stay hopeful. Nice. Should talk to you. Bye.